water. One of the most important resources you'll find in both nature and video games. It comes in many shapes and forms, like lakes, wavy oceans, bizarre otherworldly ponds, or even, well, this. In this video, you'll learn how to create your own water shader from scratch, with enough parameters to make it possible to create any type of water your imagination can think of. I hope you guys enjoy it. Let's dive in. For this project, I have already set up a few random objects here. Don't worry, you don't need these to build our water. I just added them so we can better see the effects the water will have on the objects. You can either do the same or leave the project empty. With that said, let's go ahead and create our water mesh. First, add a new child to the main node of type Mesh Instance 3D and rename it to Water. Next, in the inspector, add a new mesh of type Plane. Before creating our shader, we need to change three things on this mesh. First, set its size to one on both the X and Y axes. We will adjust the size of our water by scaling the mesh, rather than changing its size. This way, we can control the resolution of our water within the shader. Second, increase the subdivision width and depth. I'm going to set this to 200. The higher this value, the greater the resolution of the waves we will create later in this video. Finally, scale the mesh instance to your liking on the X and Z axes. I'm going to use 100 for both. Next, go to the Surface Material Override and add a new shader material. Open the material and on the shader property, add a new shader. This will create a new shader file, which you can save wherever you prefer. Now, double click on your new shader file to open the shader editor. You'll see that some things are already set up for us. Go ahead and delete everything, leaving only the fragment function and the shader type. The fragment function is responsible for changing the texture of our mesh pixel by pixel. Within this function, we can modify various material properties. For example, let's change the color of our mesh to red by setting the albedo property to a 3D vector where the red value is one and the other values are zero. As you can see, our surface is now red. You can also modify the roughness of the material. Let's set it to something like 0.5. Just like that, the changes are applied to the material. However, I want to control these values from the inspector, rather than from the shader code. To do that, we need what's called a uniform. Create a uniform of type float for the roughness, and another of type vec3 for the color of our surface. If we go on to the inspector, we can now modify these values from the shader parameters. But we can improve this even further. For example, Let's say we want our roughness to be between 0 and 1. We can add the hint underscore range annotation with the specified range, which will create a slider in the inspector and limit the values for that variable. Similarly, we can have better control over the color by using the source underscore color annotation. Now, in the inspector, we have a color picker to choose our color. Don't forget to assign these values to the albedo and roughness outputs. Now, we can adjust our materials properties directly from the inspector. The first thing we are going to address is the surface reflection. To do this, let's add two new uniforms, one for the reflection color and another for the amount of reflection we want to apply to the surface. For convenience, we can wrap these uniforms in a group underscore uniforms annotation. This will create a collapsible group in the editor, helping to keep our parameters organized. Next we need to create a function to calculate the reflection. This function will take three parameters, a float for the reflection amount, a normal vector which is perpendicular to the surface at the point of reflection, and a view vector which represents the direction from which the camera or observer is viewing the surface. This calculation is based on the Fresnel reflection equations, in case you want to explore further. But in summary, we first calculate the dot product of the normal and the view vectors, which gives us the angle between the observer and the surface normal. The result ranges from minus one to one, but we only need values between zero and one, so we clamp it to that range. A value close to zero means the observer is looking at the surface at a grazing angle, which should result in more reflection. 
A value close to 1 means the view direction is nearly perpendicular to the surface, leading to less reflection. We then invert the result so that we get more reflection as the value approaches 1 and less as it approaches 0. Finally, we raise this value to the power of our reflection amount. This sharpens or softens the transition between reflective and non-reflective areas, depending on the amount parameter. In the fragment function, we can now calculate the reflection using our function, passing in the amount, normal, and view vectors. Next, mix the surface color with the reflection color based on the reflection value, and assign the result to the albedo. Now, we can see both the base color of our surface and the reflection, depending on our viewing angle. Remember, you can adjust the reflection amount from the inspector by modifying the corresponding uniform value. Our next step is to create our wave reflections by using normals. Let's start by adding our uniforms group and add a subgroup for wave 1 and wave 2. For each wave, we will have the following uniforms. A sampler 2D, which will contain the noise texture for our wave. A VEC2 for the direction we want to translate this noise texture to in order to simulate the wave movement, the speed to which we want to translate this texture. And finally, the horizontal scale of our texture. Meaning, if we want our waves bigger or smaller, we want our waves to be dependent on the world position and not on the mesh position. This means that we'll need to add a new varying variable, which will be the position of our UV in the world. To get these values, we need to get the position of our plane's vertices. So let's go ahead and add the vertex function. Inside, multiply the values of each vertex with the model matrix. This matrix will transform coordinates from local space to world space. Assign this to our varying variable, and we can get the world position of each vertex from this variable. The reason we declare this variable as a varying variable is to be able to pass it onto the fragment shader. All variables that need to be shared between the vertex and fragment shader need to be varying variables. Let's take this step by step so you can better understand what's going on. Get the noise texture from our uniform at the current world position. Don't forget to go to the inspector and under the wave normal one parameter, add a new noise texture 2D. You should see a noise property inside the texture. Click on it and add a new fast noise light. Open it and change the values to what you prefer. I'm just going to leave it as is for now. Because we are using this texture as a normal map, tick the option on to turn it into a normal map. Also, because we are going to translate it to infinity, to make it loop, tick the option to make it seamless. Inside our shader, assign this texture's RG and B value to the normal map output. If we now zoom in in our water, we can see the waves being reflected by the light. Of course, they are too small. Let's fix that by dividing the position we want to get from the texture with our horizontal scale uniform. We can now scale the wave's normals from the inspector until we have a value we like it. To make our waves move, we need to translate the texture with a offset value. We can make this offset equal to the time already passed, multiplied by the direction we want our waves to move. Since the time variable will always be increasing, then we will always be translating our texture giving us the illusion that it is moving. Add this variable onto our position on the texture, and we can now see that our wave are moving. But they are going way too fast. To fix this, simply multiply the offset with the speed. You can now change the value of the speed of the waves in the inspector to better fit your needs. We now just need to do the same for the second wave and blend everything together. Go ahead and delete all of this, and create a new function with the code we've just seen applied to the first and the second wave. The only thing we need to add is the return of the mix of these two waves to about half each. Call our new function inside the fragment shader, store it in a variable, and assign it to the normal map. Don't forget to go to the inspector and add a new noise texture with the seamless and normal map properties on, and assign a new fast noise like function with different values than the first wave. And there you have it. We now have reflections of the waves in our surface. Now, let's address the depth of our water. First, add the following uniforms to our shader. The first two are for the colors of the water. One for the shallow part near the surface, and one for the deep part. Next, 
we have the distance over which the two colors will blend. The larger the value, the farther from the surface the colors will blend. Then, we have the depth color blend, which controls how much blending occurs between the shallow water and the deep water. Finally, we have the absorbance, which determines how quickly light is absorbed as the depth increases. To calculate the depth of the water, we'll need to use Godot's depth texture. At the top of the shader, add a uniform for the depth texture. This texture will give us the distance between the observer and the objects. However, this isn't enough on its own, since we need to calculate the vertical depth of the water plane. Let's create a new function to do that. This function will take the following parameters. The 3D position of the vertex in world space. UV coordinates that map to the texture. In our case, this will be the screen UV. A matrix that transforms coordinates from world space to view space. And finally, a matrix that transforms coordinates from view space to clip space. The first step is to calculate how far away an object is from the camera by sampling the depth texture using the UV coordinates, which are based on the screen UV. Once we have the depth from the screen, Convert the UV coordinates to normalized device coordinates, or NDC. This will map the UVX and Y values from the range 0 to 1, to minus 1 to 1. Also set the depth as the Z coordinate, since in NDC, the Z axis represents the height. Transform the NDC point into world space by multiplying the view matrix with a projection matrix, and then with a VEC4 of the NDC point. To convert this world point back to 3D space, divide each axis by the W component. But since we're only interested in the Y coordinate for the height, just divide this one and store it in a variable. Now we have the depth of all pixels in relation to the world's height axis. Next, we need the position of the vertex in world space. Transform it similarly, and then return the difference between these two values. This will give us the vertical distance between the pixels and the vertex. Inside the fragment shader, calculate the vertical depth by using this function and passing in the vertex position, the screen UV, the inverted view matrix, and the inverted projection matrix. Now, create the depth fade blend. This will be a value between 0 and 1, controlling how the color of objects behind or underneath the water changes as the water depth increases. An exponential function creates a smooth falloff, where deeper water makes objects behind it blend more with the deeper color. Next, use this blend value to calculate the underwater color by mixing the deep water color with the shallow water color. The final color of our water shader will be a blend between the surface color and the underwater color, with a blend strength that can be adjusted in the inspector. Assign our final color to the albedo and adjust the values in the inspector until you achieve the desired look. Now, you can see the depth of the water and control its colors and blending range. However, the intersection between the water surface and objects looks a bit harsh. To fix this, let's calculate an alpha blend. This will simply be the inverted vertical depth multiplied by the absorbance. Subtract the exponential of the blend from one to smooth it out and clamp the result between zero and one. Finally, Assign this blend to the alpha output. You should now see the color fading near objects as they intersect the surface, giving the water a more natural look. To create the foam, we'll need to add two new uniforms, one for the amount of foam and another for the foam color. Inside our fragment shader, before calculating the final color, create a foam blend using the following equation, and then mix the foam color with the underwater color. And that's it. You can now adjust the values in the inspector until you achieve the desired effect. Finally, let's add some waves by modifying our plane's vertices. First, add the following uniforms to our script. The first is the noise texture, which will be responsible for the wave shape, similar to how we used wave normals. Next is the vertical scale, which controls the height of the waves. Then, we have the horizontal scale which adjusts the size of the waves. Lastly, the speed will control how fast the waves travel. Now, instead of modifying our fragment shader, we'll work on the vertex shader. Inside the vertex shader, follow a similar approach as we did with the normals. First, create an offset for the wave using the time variable. This time, 
without a specific direction, though you can add one if you prefer. Next, calculate the height of the wave by sampling the value from the noise texture at the current world position. Finally, add the wave height to the Y coordinate of the vertex, multiplying it by the vertical scale to control the wave height. In the inspector, add a new noise texture. This time, don't make it a normal map, just ensure it's seamless. Create a new noise texture and adjust the values to your liking. Tweak some of the parameters, and there you have it. Moving waves achieved by altering the mesh's shape. If you need more or less detail in your waves, you can adjust the subdivision width and depth of the mesh. Go ahead and play around with our script and see what you can come up with for your video games. Don't forget that you can download the project from my website in case it helps you. I hope you had fun and learned something along the way. See you in the next one. Cheers.